Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 28. As you're turning there, I, I've got to confess to you, church, last year was a difficult year for me. My St. Louis Cardinals were terrible. I, I know some of you rubbed it in my face all year long. I know that. And, you know, I'm still working on forgiving you for that. And we'll work towards reconciliation with time, a lot of time. Uh, you know, last year they were, it was just abysmal. I mean, they couldn't do anything right. You know, I was looking at the stats. That was the worst losing season they had had in 33 years. It was the first losing season they had had in 15 years. And for the first time in I don't know how long, they didn't make the playoffs. Uh, I think it was seven out of the last ten years they'd made the playoffs, and last year they didn't. And Last year was just hard. Usually my summers are filled with seeing my boys play, then going home and unwinding, watching a Cardinal game through the MLB uh, ticket deal, uh, through you know the pay, pay stuff on TV. And Last summer, I don't remember how much baseball I watched. I didn't watch enough. just watched my kids. That's it. Well, this time of year for a Cardinal fan is – is kind of special. I know you're thinking, it's January. But as a Cardinal fan, they have what they call the winter warm-up. And it's always on MLK a weekend, and it's a big weekend in St. Louis. And it's basically, uh, it's called a fan, uh, it's called winter warm-up, but it's like a fan festival. And they open up the stadium, they open up a lot of the complexes, a lot of the hotels are hosting different events. And they bring in all the personnel, bring in all the players, or most of the players that can get there. And they invite fans to come, to come to press conferences, to hear things, to meet players, to get autographs. I guess it was about, <coughs> excuse me, about five or six years ago, that's what Joshua wanted for Christmas, so that we kind of did that, and Joshua and I did, and went and just had a great time meeting players and all kinds of things. Well, this year's was, like I said, last weekend. And, you know, they had all the press conferences and stuff, but the big cloud that just covered it, you know, even if for us sitting at home watching a little bit online, was, man, we were bad last year. It was just a terrible year. How's it going to be different? And uh, one of the uh, press conferences they had was with the uh, baseball's, excuse me, the Cardinals' president of operations, John Mozalak. <clears throat> and he said, you know, there's no hiding it. We were bad last year. We really were. It's unheard of for our organization to be as bad as we were, as, especially with a rich history of winning, you know, 11 World Championships, Braves fans. I mean, it's hard to argue with that, right? Unless you're a Yankees fan. Whatever, I won't get into that. Let me just take a drink on that one. A toast, if you will. No. Uh, <laughs> but he said this. He said, it's hard to be successful when you don't do the little things well. He says, it's hard to be a winning team when you don't do the little things well. You know, as I heard that, of course, I was like, I was thinking about the Cardinals. I was like, yeah, our defense was horrible. Our pitching staff, terrible. Bullpen, totally unreliable. And you go on down the list, and all those little things that were really big things when it comes to baseball was bad. So it was no surprise that we had the record that we had, and we found ourselves um, hunting in October, you know, as far as the team is concerned. You know, as I think about the church, I think about, just as Randy noted this morning, the power that a church should have, which relies on the, that intimacy with the Holy Spirit, you know, if we want to be, you know, and I know we, we struggle with using this word as success as a church, but when we want to be faithful, when we want to be fruitful, we have to do the little things well. Those little things, which are big things. We talk about prayer. We talk about Bible study. We talk about discipleship. You know, as we've been working through our, our vision uh, kind of series, as we do every year at the beginning of the year, Last week we talked about worship and just who God is and how it should uh, move us to respond in, in obedience, move us to respond in worship. You know, this week we kind of narrow our focus on growth, you know, being committed to discipleship. You know, many of us have talked about uh, that next chapter for each other. You know, what, what's, what's next for us? How can we be fruitful in this season? You know, to borrow the words of the Cardinals Baseball of Operations, we've got to do the little things well. We've got to do the things that God's called us to do well, faithfully. We've got to be making disciples. And so today, as we narrow our focus on that for our message, uh, my heart went to this passage here in Colossians 1, uh, 28 and 29. I'll uh, sh share it with you at this time. It says this, 
speaking of Christ. <coughs> it says, Him we proclaim, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I told, struggling with all His energy, that He powerfully works in me. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for just time to be in Your Word. And I pray that the power of Your Word, which comes through the working of the Holy Spirit, speaks to our heart this morning. Lord, You help us to look at those little things, which are massive things, such as discipleship, Lord. And help us to evaluate our personal discipleship, our personal approach to discipleship, but also our, our approach as brothers and sisters and how we care for each other and how we care for each other's maturity when it comes to spiritual growth. Father, I pray that we leave this place enriched and changed for your glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning as we look at this passage, I think it's important for us to note there's a, a codependency that exists with those that place their faith in Christ. Meaning this, that your spiritual growth and my spiritual growth are connected. Of course, um, our growth is dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the transformative work that happens there. But God's economy of it, or the, God, or the way that God does it, is He works in us in conjunction with other believers. And other believers' experiences, as well as their encouragement, their, their even rebuke in our lives to help us to know how to grow and uh, how we can grow in our intimacy and understanding of the Lord and how we're to live our life. So today, as we work through this passage, we'll see these two focuses. And as you read it, I'm sure you saw it as well. As we talk about discipleship, as we talk about spiritual growth, we see growth with others you know, within the body, but then we'll see growth brought about by Christ himself. You know, first, as we think about growth with others, we see uh, that followers of Christ have a responsibility to warn and teach everyone. Now that terminology, everyone, you think, well, that's a lot of folks. But as we look at the context of everything here, we see that uh, this is right after uh, Paul is introducing this idea of the mystery of the Gentiles. In other words, acknowledging that Christ has come for not only the Jews, but for the Gentiles. Gentiles meaning anybody that's what? Not a Jew. So all people. So as Paul has said, Christ is for all people. Now he's saying, if you're following after Christ, then you have an obligation to all people, all kinds of people. Not just the people that you're familiar with, not just the people that look like you, not just the people that live like you, but all people. You have a, a responsibility, a stewardship with them. And it says there, what do you have a responsibility to do? You have a responsibility to warn them and to teach them. Now let's just unpack that just a little bit. As we think about warning, uh, now, if I'm warning you about something, I'm admonishing you or, or trying to get your attention about something that you're headed the wrong way or you're, you're doing the wrong thing or there's something dangerous in your path. I'm trying to show you concern as well as trying to get you to change your behavior or to change your course. And as a follower of Christ, one that has experienced who Jesus is, we have a responsibility to warn people, to admonish them, to urge them to face reality. To face the truth. And the truth is, for each and every one of us, that apart from Christ, we're lost. Apart from Christ, we're still in our sin. We're still condemned. We still face the, the, re, the, the wrath of God. The full judgment of God. And when we understand that, we understand the who. We understand who we are. Who our need is, or what our need is. We also understand who Jesus is. And what He's done in response to our need. What He's done in response to who we are. Through His provision. Through His death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. So as a follower of Christ, we're to warn people. We're to help people see who they are and then who Christ is. And what God's done about their, their plight in life. What God has done about their sinfulness. The second thing that we see there though is, is that God has called us and commanded us to teach everyone. So the warning is evangelism, sharing with them the good news about what God has done for them in the midst of their, of their sinfulness. But then the second part of that is discipleship, teaching everyone, proclaiming with the intent of showing them how to follow Christ, how to live a life that exalts Christ. So the who was warning, the how is the, is the teaching, is the training. How? 
How are we to follow Jesus? How are we to live for Him? That instruction that helps them to navigate the reality of who they are and navigate what it looks like to follow Jesus. I'll take a drink eventually. Some of you are like, he's holding it long enough, just take a drink. Sorry. So we see this responsibility that rests on all believers. But as we see also in this passage, it says that we're to do this with what? Wisdom. Looking back, it says, In Him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom. And how are we to do that with all wisdom? Well, we're to do that with all wisdom because we know His Word. We're to do that with all wisdom because we've spent time in His Word. We've grown to understand who He is and what His Word says about us and what His Word says about the world and what His Word says about other people. Now, that's how we're to do that in wisdom, and that's a dependency upon the, on the work of, of the Holy Spirit in us. You know, we're not going to have a high value for helping other people if we've never really understood how much God has helped us. If we've never understood and, and humbled ourselves to the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because we're going to, just as we talked about this morning, talking about the value of human life, as we're talking about after, after the flood and, and, and as God instructs Noah, you know, we have a high value of human life when we have a realistic value of who we are. You know, if we think that we're the center of the universe and we're uh, very selfish, then we're going to view other people differently. We're going to view them as less than us. And we're not going to value them. We're not going to value their life. Now, maybe we're not going to be, uh, you know, out there seeking to harm people, but we don't place them uh, in a place where we would uh, want to care for their needs as we should. But when we experience God and we experience His truth and we allow it to train us and teach us and live in submission to it, it changes our perspective to God's perspective. Where we see Him, one that is one that is willing to give mercy, that is willing to give grace, that is willing to do whatever it takes to meet our need. And so it is with other people. We, we want to warn them, we want to admonish them, we want to teach them because we see their need. We see who they really are and we see that they have a need for Christ. They have a need to grow and understand His love for them. Grow and understand how much He uh, has a purpose for them. Not to leave them to figure it out on their own. And I know I've shared this illustration with you before, but I think it's, it's so vivid. And I, I remember the first time I share it in my evangelism classes, they always are sh- kind of shocked by it. But so often we kind of approach our faith in, in this way, you know, where we have a, you know, using our, our fellowship and example, we say we've, well, we've got a new little one on the back row there, all right? That's a member of the church. You know, Josh and Hannah just had him at, I guess, it's been a little over a month now, right? Yeah. So, you know, we were all excited about that day when it would come, and we were always, and I know they probably heard it 20 million times, oh, your world's going to change, oh, you don't know, you know. <laughs> Josh probably got a little tally in his pocket about how many times people have told him that, and then asked now, how much has your life changed? Or has he sleeping much? All those things. But we were celebrating with him. When that day came, and of course when he was born before Christmas, and them experiencing Christmas with him, and all these things, and I know they're experiencing all those, those firsts right now. They're excited about it. So often in the church, we're like that, spiritually. We're excited about someone coming to faith, being born. But when it comes to helping them live life, it would be like they, Josh and Hannah, after a couple more weeks, okay guys, they just take him out in the woods and leave him. Same for Stephen and Jessica with their little one. You know, he's been he's been going at it what six months now. Oh man, you should already left him out there, man. What are you talking about? I know that's crazy to even think about when we talk about little. <laughs> Hannah's telling him, "No, I'm not going to do that. I promise." <laughs> I know that's crazy and just way out there to think of that type of illustration, but spiritually, that's what we do so often in the church. We celebrate with people when they proclaim their faith in Christ, when they stir the baptismal waters. But when it comes to following Jesus and helping them to see, okay, this is how you pray. This is how you do Bible study. You know, if you need somebody to talk to about this and that, so often we just leave them on their own to figure it out. The Scriptures tell us what? We're to proclaim Christ. We're to warn people. We're to teach people. Everyone. And do it with wisdom because we've experienced it ourselves. As this unpacks even more, we'll see that the responsibility to bring them even to maturity. This last part, as we see there, we work to present everyone mature in Christ. Now, I want to unpack that step by step, and we've already kind of got the cart before the horse a little bit, but look at this part, the present aspect. We're to work to present 
other people. Now, if we look at the context of this passage, a little bit earlier in this uh, chapter, uh, Jesus talks about this. He says this in, in 1.22. It says, Jesus comes to present us holy and blameless. Talking about the work that Christ does in us so that on the last day, the day of judgment, when we stand before God because of the work that Christ has done in us, He will see us as holy and blameless. We'll be presented that way. But now there's a responsibility for us to present other people. Think about that. We have a responsibility, as Paul is acknowledging here first century, and here we are, 21st century, as believers acknowledging this too. We have a responsibility to present other people, what? Mature in Christ. You have a stewardship. I have a stewardship as a follower of Christ to help my brother and sister grow in their faith. There was not a hands-off. I mean, I hope you figure it out, Emmett. I hope you figure it out. You know, I hope, hope you, got, you got all the pieces together. We'll encourage you along the way. No, it's, it's a responsibility to be there and make sure they're making progress. You know, let's, let's just think about it. Let's think of situations here. And some of the, please don't call my name. Please don't call my name. Sorry, it's, it's whatever. Let's think about Joe. Sorry, Joey. <laughs> Joey. You know, Joey is a follower of Christ. He's a part of Echota Baptist Church, just like Josh is on the back row. You know, whether we're thinking about uh, 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 within our own fellowship or we're thinking about the church as a whole because they have a commonality of being in this fellowship, but they're, they have a responsibility to each other. And I could go around the room, male, female, I could go all the way around. There's a responsibility you have to other believers to make sure they're maturing in growth, maturing in Christ. Because on that day, we are to call to present others as being mature. Of course, as we've already noted, the Holy Spirit's at work in this, and we'll, we'll talk about that in that last verse here in a moment. And He empowers us to do that. But did you ever think about that? That's part of our stewardship. That's part of what it means to be a disciple that makes disciples. Not to be a couch, couch Christian that you know is entertained and told what to study and listens to a sermon or so and then comes back on Sunday and maybe Wednesday and hears again and goes back about normal life. No, we're actively involved in community. We're actively involved in the lives of other people, of other believers. Presenting everyone, back to that word again, all people. You know, just as we look at the fulfillment of all things, as we think about that day of judgment, the day of presentation, if you will, about everyone, it says that people will be there from what? Every tribe, tongue, and nation. All encompassing, all inclusive language. That all people will have a chance to know Christ. All people will be represented on that day. Now, we know that all people won't place their faith in Christ, but we do know that. Uh, there will some, be some from all different types of people in the world. And here we are sitting in, in Calhoun, Georgia, here at Echota Baptist Church. We're to have a, a stewardship that meets towards that goal. We're to have what some have been calling, this is a weird word, a global focus. Yes, be concerned where we are locally, but globally looking at, okay, how does my discipleship, how does my heart for the Lord impact the nations? Reach beyond this. And one of the things we've, we've kind of uh, done is we've, we've moved forward and, and sought to be focused on the little things well is, is discipleship. And I've, I've talked about this a little bit a couple of weeks ago with our, our deacon discipleship and, and even how we've transitioned Sunday night. And I'm excited about tonight because I know some of those groups are, are starting to work, you know, work together and some are still trying to connect because I know a lot of things are happening there. But this is a good direction we're heading in. But as I look at that, and I'm excited about it, I, I want to make sure that you're on the same page that I am. And I know our, our deacons are, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about it, but many of you are just kind of first hearing about it or maybe have questions about it. So I want to share it with you this way, and hopefully this, this isn't too complex the way I've, I've done it. But I want us to think about being a disciple that makes disciples. Okay, I want us to think about multiplication here. I want to give you, and I'll use my kind of starting with me and, and going from there. And using some hypotheticals here, uh, but at the same time. So we have this, I don't know how well you can see that. We have this illustration here. Um, this is, uh, the, the name at the very top, the name is Bill. And that's, that's my former student minister when I was growing up, okay? A uh, gentleman that married Laura and I, all right, officiated at our service. Uh, and we've had, we've stayed in touch, but not a whole lot, but... 
the Lord has used him in my life to disciple me. And there's times that I'll, I'll still to this day call him, and we'll talk about things in Scripture, we'll talk about things I'm dealing with. And he's one of the many people that God's brought in my life to disciple me and mentor me. And, I, and I'll just use him in this example. But in that, that group uh, with Bill, um, there's my buddy Aaron, okay? It's not Aaron, it's Aaron, okay? And it's, it's, I don't know, that's what his parents call him. And he's, we just call him Big A, okay? Good friend. He's one of those friends that you cannot talk to at all, but you pick up the phone, then you're laughing like crazy. You know, all those inside jokes, all that stuff, you know, just silly stuff. Here's my buddy Aaron. Uh, he was uh, part of this group, myself in the middle, and my other buddy Josh, all right? He was that guy that I grew up with that was kind of always right above me in school, and I was always like chasing, trying to beat him and stuff, but I was a better artist, so it didn't matter. Whatever, okay, but I'm sorry, I digress. But these were my buddies, some of my buddies, and this is just a, a snapshot of it. But Bill was pouring into each one of us, okay? Teaching us what it meant to follow the Lord, what it meant to be a godly man, and so many things. And I know for me, um, you know, so many individuals, including Laura's dad, uh, that that God has used to help me understand what that means. Because growing up, not really having a, uh, a, a stable father figure, that was instrumental for me. So as we look back to it here, this is that first generation, if you will. Now again, following my thread, just my thread. Not that these guys didn't do it, but just for our example here. We'll see from there, that next thread. Okay, Again, just taking a snapshot of lives here. You know, within this next thread, I've got a few selected. I've, I've got Caleb's in there. My son, Caleb. Of course, I have three boys. It's not like I'm alienating them, but Caleb's in that group. They are as well. Adam. I'm including Adam today as our deacon. He's going to be our point of illustration as we move forward. You could put all of our deacons there. All right. Owen. And some of you had a chance to meet Owen when he helped us out over the summer. Brett is another young man here in the community that I'm working with. And again, the list could go on and on. These are guys that I'm have an opportunity to pour into that God has allowed for me again to do life with and to journey with to learn from but also to speak truth into their life now as we talk about where we're at as a fellowship right now I'm going to illustrate that with where Adam is Adam's a part of that that group that I'm journeying with right now obviously our involvement here on the hill here at Echota involvement as he's head of the deacons We've had a chance to, to minister and, and share with our, our deacons throughout the last few months as they're preparing for this next stage. I know that many of you are about to begin. So as we look at Adam and we look at just our discipleship group that we're just beginning, we see that he and his group have, have four individuals. And that doesn't mean that Adam's only uh, uh, discipling or mentoring four individuals. We're just focusing on those four that we've kind of assigned within our fellowship. So we see Julie, and there's his bride right over here. All right, Ronald and Sonia right here up front. All right, and then Patsy, where's Patsy? There you go. Hey, all yours are here, dude. Way to go. Hey, that saves them on a cold day. All right, so there's, there's Adam's crew, okay? So looking at what we're doing right now, or what we're encouraging within our fellowship, we're wanting to do the little things well. We want to focus on discipleship, being disciples that make disciples. We want to focus on multiplication. We want, again, to warn and teach everyone, present them mature before Christ. So just as Bill saw that as a responsibility to pour in me and some of my buddies, the Lord used him among other people, has used his word, the prompting of the Holy Spirit to move upon my heart to see that as a priority, to pour into other people. You know, part of that is my my role here as pastor, my role here to serve alongside the deacons and to encourage them, my role to, to lead us as a fellowship uh, towards doing these things the right way led by the Holy Spirit. Not just doing them in manly attempts, but doing them led by the Holy Spirit. And then as we approach that, we are now approaching this deacon discipleship model of discipleship and multiplication. So as we look here at this stage, and I believe Adam said their crew, I don't know if they're meeting tonight or trying to, but they're working towards that first meeting. They're going to start working through discipleship material together. Uh, learning together, journeying through the Word together, hearing from the Lord together sharpening each other as they seek to be obedient to the Lord. But just as with the, with the deacons, just as it with Adam, we'll see that there'll come a time, and I've already heard some scared of this part here too, where those four will be encouraged to look for four other people. Look for people to pour into. And I know for many of them, if not all of them, they already have people that you're doing that with. But we're just praying that as you see this modeled before you, <clears throat> excuse me, 
you see this modeled before you that you too will see, okay, how God has called me to be a disciple that makes a disciple. Now, just as our deacons did in that first time I kind of shared this with them and encouraged them, I saw some of the guys go, you, you want me to teach? What you talking about, Willis? I, that's not my gift. That's not what we're saying here. We're just inviting you and encouraging you to do life with people and allow the Lord to be the fabric that weaves you together, the gospel to weave you together. You know, I know for the first few meetings, uh, you know, of course the deacons have been through this material and they'll be the expert in the room or so. But as you're reading the book that we're working through, obviously as you're looking at the scripture that you'll be dealing with, you just trust the Holy Spirit to guide that time. So when we work through this, gentlemen, as you're doing that, as an encouragement to you, but as we get to that next level, you're here in a few months, as we're encouraging you to look for people within our fellowship and within our community that you can connect with and share with, to warn and to teach, we're praying that the Lord will be uh, giving you the boldness and the strength as well as the the awareness and the discernment on on who those people are, the wisdom aspect here. But that comes from being with him. That comes from knowing his voice. That comes from following him. And that's that's where we're headed as we consider this deacon discipleship model that we're talking about, doing the little things well. Now, I, I didn't have a lot of room on the slide, but, you know, each one of those, then they branch off. And each one, you see the multiplication. You know, as we look back, couple of thousand years ago over in Jerusalem there was maybe 120 believers if you talk about those that were in the upper room at Pentecost and then it just blew up and now here we are 2,000 years removed about 6,500 miles from Jerusalem and we're sitting in a building talking about the truths of scripture because of disciples making disciples that multiplication that happens through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit So as we look at this very last part, we talk about, yes, growth with other people, but how does that growth happen? It happens by Christ. It happens by His Spirit. Look back with me, if you will. In verse 29, so even for you guys and gals that are beginning this and you're maybe uh, overwhelmed by, I hope I can do this, or I'm not sure about this, or the next stage, what does it say here? Or you're thinking about sharing with a friend. It says, verse 29, for this I toil. So I work at this, struggling with whose energy? Not yours. His struggling with all His energy that He powerfully works within me. Can I tell you this? If you're going to be stuck in your own power thinking, how am I going to do this? You're not going to do it. You're not going to be able to accomplish it. You're not going to be able to make it fit your schedule. You're not going to be able to do um, you know, the, the regular... You're not even going to be able to do the readings. You're just, always something's going to happen. But if you trust Him... You trust Him. If you humble yourself and say, Lord, here's my life, use it. I'll make a way. Um, you know, just being honest with you, and you know, I know my, my family's here, and they're, like, oh, they're always just love when I bring up ma'am in the midst of the sermon. As I look at my own family, I've not done the job that I need to do to disciple them. As I think about making disciples that make disciples, that's a stewardship that the Lord has given me. Yeah, I mean, I buy books for my family, I encourage them, I pray for my family, but I don't challenge them enough and say, hey, Elijah, what God, what's God teaching you right now? I mean, I say, what would you learn in Sunday school or something? But that's something for me, the Lord's really spoke to my heart recently, and especially as I've been working through this message in preparation for this, and we've focused on our, on our focus here as a fellowship, is we've got to start at home. Those people that live with us, or maybe those people that are our kids, and maybe they moved out, are we ready to present them as mature in Christ? Are we okay with saying, you know, here's my son. You entrusted him to me to, to lead him, to, uh, to help him you know, grow into a young man, or to grow into a man, and I've helped, and I've encouraged him to follow you as well. You know, as I think about where I'm at with my boys right now, I've not done a good job of that yet. I've helped, I think, I've encouraged, but there's more I could do, just being real with you guys. And I, you pray for me as I pray for you, that I lead my family better, that I lead you guys better. But first of all, that I lead them better than I lead you. Just being real, because they're my first stewardship. And if you want me to lead you better than them, then I'm, I'm resigning today, just being honest. Because they're my first responsibility. As your first responsibility is those people that the Lord puts in your care, whether they be your family or that circle of friends that you have, Those kids, that spouse, 
those close friends God brings into your life so that you may lead them. You may bring them so that you may present them mature before the Lord. Just as there's people in your life that are, should be working towards the help to present you as mature before the Lord. And how is all that done? That's done in His power. It's done by yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. So as we move forward as a fellowship, as we move forward seeking to focus on those little things that are really the main things of discipleship, I just encourage each one of us to really search our heart and see, okay, am I serious? First off, about my own spiritual growth. You don't just drift into it. You're not, you don't just, oh, I think I'll grow closer to the Lord. You have to be intentional. You have to yield. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to, to take over and change things in your heart. Be man enough to say, I've dropped the ball somewhere, but Lord, help me. Help me to see the path forward. Help me to repent of those behaviors that, that kept me from doing what I need to do. And then when the Lord shows you, what you need to do is to stay, take those steps of faith and follow Him. You know, here as a fellowship, in order for us to be faithful, in order for us to be fruitful, We've got to be serious about biblical discipleship. We've got to be serious about pouring into each other's lives. And then looking for other people to introduce to Jesus. And to help them to see how to follow Him. To warn and instruct. Paul says this. Is, towards the end of his ministry, he's writing to the church at Colossae. He says this, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. For all those at Laodicea and all for you who have not seen me face to face that your heart will be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and for the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are all hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You know, Paul's saying there he struggled for other believers. Yeah, he struggled for his own self to be faithful to the Lord, but he also struggled for others. He desired that others would grow and reach understanding and knowledge of Christ. I guess to boil it down this way, you struggle and work towards having your brothers and sisters in this room to grow in maturity in Christ? Are you genuinely concerned about Eric's spiritual growth? Are you genuinely concerned about Tom's spiritual growth? I mean, we could go all around the room. We should be. Because as we grow in the Lord, we desire the things He desires, the things that He wants things that He wants to see come to pass in other people's lives. And He wants all of us to be mature in Him. So I just encourage you, as you search your heart and you seek to grow in the Lord, also seek to grow in biblical discipleship, being a disciple that makes disciples. I know things are different as far as our invitation time uh, today without music, but what I'd like for us to do is just kind of have an open altar time, a time of prayer, um, a time to, to pray, Focus our hearts in submission to the Holy Spirit as we've been challenged this morning. A time for us to maybe rec recommit ourselves to spiritual growth. A uh, time to recommit ourselves to investing in other people. Uh, I'm going to ask, and I know they weren't expecting, I'm going to ask my family if you will come forward. Uh, spend a time of prayer with me. Maybe you're here with your family and you want to come forward and, and spend some time in prayer. But use this time uh, to commit it to the Lord and be real with the Lord. Uh, let's enter into a time of prayer. The altar is open.